Thank you. And as I think Peter was careful to say, it's not the end of COVID, but the end of the public health emergency. And it's very clear we've entered a new phase at, at, at UCSF. We're no longer filling out our symptom checker. The parking lots are full. Uh, but nationally, uh, we're seeing the end of many mandates, and mask mandates in many circumstances, vaccine mandates, seeing a marked increase in travel. The White House COVID office is, uh, is, is uh, uh, changing, at least coming down. Uh, today, the CDC director announced that she is stepping down. So there's a lot going on that signals that COVID is entering a new and different phase. But very importantly, it is not going away and probably won't go away, I'm guessing, forever. Uh, let us not forget the toll that it has taken with more than one million of our fellow Americans who've passed away from it uh, and the stresses that it has placed on our, our patients, our workforce, uh, the amount of the burnout. Uh, we've also become, if anything, more polarized as a society, although all of us hope that it would bring us together. Uh, and there are still 150 people a day dying of COVID. So it's a pretty complex a phase in the pandemic or in the epidemic and one that is in some ways a little tougher to navigate because with fewer mandates and fewer rules we're all having to make up how we live our lives and the way we choose to live our lives today is probably uh, needs to be about a facsimile of the way we're going to live our lives over the next few years because I don't know that all that much is going to change. Uh, so we have five uh, fantastic guests to talk about uh, where we've been and a little bit about where we're going. We have about uh, 25 minutes to do that, so we'll get to as much as we can. Uh, let me introduce them. They'll turn their cameras on as I do. Josh Adler, everybody knows, is the Chief Clinical Officer at UCSF Health. Uh, Sarah Dornberg is Associate Professor of Clinical Medicine in the Department of Medicine in the Division of Infectious Diseases, has been one of the leaders in our policy response to COVID. Kathy Yang is Professor and Co-Vice Dean of Clinical Innovation and Entrepreneurship in our School of Pharmacy. Karina Marquez is Associate Professor of Medicine. Uh, she is in the Division of HIV, Infectious Diseases, uh, Global Medicine at Zuckerberg uh, San Francisco General Hospital. Uh, and Maria Raven is a Professor in, uh, and Chief in Emergency Medicine here at UCSF Health and has been one of the key leaders uh, for us in COVID. So welcome to all of you. Uh, Josh, let me, uh, let me start with you. Um, you've been at UCSF a long time, not as long as me, because I remember you when you were a resident and I was a young attending. Uh, but you knew a lot about this place beforehand. What did you learn about UCSF from uh, the response to the pandemic that you didn't know before 2020? Uh, very good question. And yes, we've both been around quite a while, uh, Bob. Um, I, knew, I knew that the people of UCSF had the capacity and would generally um, generally err on the side of uh, rising to the occasion, for sure. I had known that because we'd been through a few smaller crises before, but nothing nothing of the scale. What I didn't know was that it would come from every pore uh, of UCSF. So it was everybody who was worked in healthcare, everybody who worked in laboratories. It was students. It was staff. It was faculty. It was groups of people who don't even consider themselves part of the UCSF community, but have some connection to us um, outside of UCSF. That I was not expecting. When we put out the call for help, we routinely got four or five X number of people volunteering to help in some way. And so that was that was a, sort of a, an example of it was way more than I knew about us. Um, the other thing I knew about us was that there was in, there were we were a group of innovators, um, whether that's uh, innovator in the classic sense of literally making something new that we didn't have or doing something a different way. And that's another place where we just uh, exceeded expectations or certainly my expectations, whether it was innovating about making our own PPE uh, in a, a laboratory, in the library, yeah. or inventing new pathways for uh, patient care on our many wards, or um, uh, in the, and of course we can't for, forget the extraordinary role the Biohub played in actually developing the actual test so that we could test people for COVID and then offering it to everyone in California. Yeah. Yeah, I remember a comment I think you've made earlier is, you know, who of us thought about the people in purchasing 
before all this and then in the yeah. beginning like the, they're the only ones who matter actually <laughs> so it was uh it was very impressive and really demonstrated the breadth of of of, of uh skills and also uh, commitment it was yeah. really really impressive maybe one more quick question for you uh, one of the things that struck me about the early days of the pandemic response was uh uh, we essentially went to a form of healthcare martial law. Essentially, all decisions were being made by a very small group of people because we didn't have time for all of the normal processes, committees, bureaucracy. And people asked me back then, what's going to happen when it's over? Are we just going to snap back to our usual ways or there's going to be some muscle memory about, oh, we can be more nimble because we were. Uh, so we're three years later and the stresses are a little bit lower. Are we more nimble as an organization than we were? Uh, before March 2020, or have we snapped back to our old habits? Well, on one hand, I think we have mostly snapped back to our usual processes, uh, whether that's a process of decision making, a process of care, a process of of um, interaction. Uh, what I would say, though, is I do believe we are, I hope, permanently changed in the in the sense that we are in a better state of preparation. So that should we be faced with something of this scale, we will more quickly know how to respond or and what elements of a response we need to do. Mm -hmm. um, I'm actually, you know, as one of the members of that small team, I am delighted uh, to not have a situation of martial law. Um, that, and it was never really martial law, but you know what I that mean. that was highly uncomfortable, uh, yeah. I have to say, and it was so different from our normal way. And and I was ex it was extraordinary the way everyone responded to to mandates that were not necessarily based in evidence because we often didn't have any evidence at all, and yet everybody did their best to to follow the rules. Um, but I think now we are more in a state where much more is known, and actually. People are making their own decisions about their own safety in the most proper way possible. Yeah, yeah, that, I think that's 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 right. Great. Uh, well, that's a perfect segue to Sarah. So, uh, uh, Sarah, you were you were and are one of the people that we turn to to help figure out what the rules should be uh, in terms of masking and vaccines and all those sort of things. And as those mandates have been relaxed, there's still a few of them. Um, how do you think we did? And, 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 and what do you think of the present environment? I think, you know, one issue that comes up is there are a lot of places that have relaxed mandates uh, for masking, even in patient care areas. And at least last time I checked, we have not done that. So uh, maybe reflect on that experience and then also talk about today's world and how you're thinking about those sort of things now. Sure. And there were definitely many, many people uh, involved in these decisions. I think the um, you know, it was maybe fewer than than usual as far as the martial law question, but um, not not usually one. Um, you know, I think we did the best we could with the information we had at the time. Um, at times, there were things that we changed that we learned were, you know, got more evidence and and changed uh, over time. But I think that we were operating under the be the best that we could do as far as when we give vaccines, what types of masking, who masks, what, you know, what the requirements are, what's recommended, um, that, you know, as, this, as the evidence evolves, we tweaked recommendations um, accordingly. Mm -hmm. um, it feels like where we are now is appropriate. Um, there, there are pros and cons to continuing masking inside the healthcare setting. Um, I think we've learned some things about um, other benefits of wearing masks to some of our most vulnerable patients. We know that there are also downsides uh, to that, that you know, it can be difficult for communication. I think that's going to continue to be an ongoing discussion um, as far as that goes. And as Josh says, I think People are making their own decisions as far as um, what what to do when they're out in the community, and that feels appropriate to me for when they're in non-clinical areas also. Do you think the mask mandate in clinical settings is going to last forever? I don't think it will last forever, but I wouldn't be surprised if there were some changes that 
became more permanent, maybe around respiratory virus season in immunocompromised populations or things like that. I, I think we've learned some lessons that, that may be applied and keep some of our patients safer than uh, previously we were doing. Yeah. Any, uh, as you said, some of the, 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 the policies, restrictions that we put in place, we found out weren't right. The evidence changed. And anything that in retrospect we got wrong, and uh, one thing comes to mind, I wonder the visitor policy was so traumatic in so many ways. Obviously, I understand where it came from, and, 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 and at some level it felt right from, a, from an infection control standpoint. Do you think we got that one right? I think hindsight is always 2020. Um, I, you know, you hear the stories of what some of the families um, went through where they couldn't be with their loved ones during the really tough illnesses, both COVID and non-COVID. Um, and we know that being connected to people is important and that patients don't always understand what they're told and having a caregiver with them can help to increase um, understanding of complex diagnoses and prognoses. And so I think that there was probably something lost in those restrictions. I think some of the other things that um, we, as an ID field, I think got wrong was coming out of the gates really hard on the droplet versus airborne kind of divide. Um, and I think having some more flexibility and understanding that science um, w would have been helpful and may have informed some early decisions. Yeah, um, yeah. That, that strikes me as just we got smarter over time. I think the, the, the visitor thing is we maybe got more sensitive and it reminds me a little bit of the schools and sort of understanding the trade-offs and maybe have a slightly different way of weighing them the next time. An incredibly tricky call and everybody did the best they could. Uh, thank you. Uh, let's turn to Kathy uh, Yang. And uh, Kathy, the School of Pharmacy sort of was up, was front and center in vaccine policy and vaccine distribution. And, I, and you know, I've always felt that the pharmacists add amazingly uh, to our, the value of our clinical care, and I wish we had more of them. And uh, but. Um, uh, what are your reflections on on what we learned, not only about the process of getting vaccines out there and setting policy, but also your connection to the day to day work of the of the health system and to UCSF? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the one thing I think I learned also with Sarah, just doing all the vaccine and therapeutics stuff. I mean, we really had to pivot continuously when new information came out, new therapeutics. You know, we went through five or six different monoclonal antibodies, the guidelines changed, how much drug we had changed. Um, and with vaccines as well, you know, when we could give boosters, you know, everything was just rolling super fast. And everybody had the pivot. And when it came down to it, we actually did it. Like it was it's mind boggling when I think about how many times we had to pivot every time a guideline was changed. I mean, it's like, I always joke that, you know, COVID was like writing a COVID lecture was like buying a new car. As soon as you wrote the lecture, it was obsolete. You know, as soon as you drove it off the lot, it was done. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had to keep up. And that was something that I think everybody in the health system just did remarkably. Yeah. And in terms of kind of the biggest vaccine decision now is should people take the new bivalent? Um, I'm 65. I know I don't look at you don't have to say that. Uh, but um, I did last week uh, was and I'm pretty healthy. Was that the right call? That was the right call. I think um, the way the CDC has uh, has listed it, though, in the recommendation, it's it's a little confusing. It calls it an optional booster which is a, a different language than they've used in the past where they just say recommend a booster. Now it's an optional booster. Um, I think what people are concerned about is if I get the booster now, does that mean I can't get a booster in the fall when COVID, there's more COVID? And um, what I've been telling people is just not worry about that yet. I can't imagine people, they won't allow, you know, there won't be some kind of contingency planning for that when we get to to the fall. So if you qualify for the booster, it's a good idea to get it. Okay. 
Thank you. And um, I, the, the reason they think about, they worry about the fall is not just there might be more COVID, but that at least theoretically, there'll be a newfangled, rejiggered vaccine, a booster that'll be uh, targeted to the variants du jour today. Uh, first of all, is that in play? Is that what will happen in for the booster in the fall? And how important might that be? Yeah, I think they are looking at, you know, what is the what is the next what is the next vaccine, right? What is the next one that's going into the vaccine? I think they're looking at that now. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we won't know that information, I think, until we get closer to the fall, what that ver version will be. Great, great. Let me turn to Karina. Um, you did a lot of things, you and your colleagues, and, and, and did a lot of things during the, uh, the height of the pandemic. Probably most visibly was the work you did with the community and I was proud of UCSF for a lot of reasons, but I think took particular pride in, in, in what ordinarily would be something that wouldn't work very well. The academic community thing is always a little fraud and there's a little town gown. Um, at least the, the, the press, uh, the, the, sort of the, 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 uh, what you hear about it is it, was, it went great. Uh, so tell us, did it go great? And are there things sort of under the hood that we, <laughs> that we don't know, but you saw that, uh, that we don't really understand how hard it was and some of the things that you had to do to make it all work. Thank you. Um, I think great, great question. And I think um, there were many things that I think went well and that we can um, learn from and I think kind of specifically try to sustain and um, uh, uh, moving forward in our efforts to address health equity. I think um, one of the things that um, this pandemic really emphasized was the importance of community partnerships um, and how community partnerships with community-led solutions, partnering with healthcare centers and, and universities and the Department of Public Health really helped get, um, I think, a lot of the reach we needed to um, uh, increase the uptake of a lot of our biomedical prevention, you know, vaccines, testing, and treatment um, to um, the communities that were really disproportionately affected. And I think the data is there. I think in San Francisco, we have, at least for the primary series with vaccine uptake, we have um, uh, really, our, my focus was on the Latino community, really, um, uh, I think, decreased uh, disparities there. Um, but I think, you know, it took some time, I think at UCSF and I think in, with our Unidos and Salud community academic collaboration in part because of support from UCSF and as well as other donors, we were able to launch into action very quickly. But I think as we're moving forward and I think when you're thinking about pandemic responses in the future, what are the things that um, enable us to sustain these partnerships, um, to continue to do the work for COVID, which is still here, we are going to see, I think we're anticipating gaps within who's getting treatments, who, how do, you know, who's getting the bivalent vaccine and these partnerships um, and maintaining those are going to be important to um, work to close these, um, close these gaps. Um, so thinking about how we fund these partnerships moving forward, um, both as an institution and um, within our state and within our nation. Um, and then by sustaining these, these interventions, you can really, if when the next pandemic happens, and I think when we thought about MPOX, a lot of these partnerships are already to, you know, in place. We were able to launch really quickly. Um, and so I think by continuing to fund these, to continue to be embedded in the community, um, we will be able to respond quickly. And I think um, uh, earlier on in the pandemic, um, it took a little while to get the funding into the community. And I think the second point, not only kind of sustained funding for community partnerships helps us act quickly, but also, I think um, um, what we really learned, I think what worked well, and it also took us a little while to figure out how to, how to do this, was um, delivering care outside of the brick and mortar health institution, um, uh, whether it be community-based testing centers, whether it be pharmacies, um, really thinking about how to do that quickly and how to scale that up quickly. We were able to, you know, we were able to reach people who were not um, yet engaged in, in healthcare. Um, and so I think trying to think about how we sustain that for health to tackle our existing health disparities and also to scale up for other pandemics as they will come. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I hope not, but they, they probably will. That, that's fantastic. And I think the, the point is important. It's not just infectious diseases. You know, what have we learned about treating hypertension or diabetes or sort of everything? And how do we leverage the, you know, the muscle memory from this to do that? So uh, congratulations to you and your colleagues. It was really magnificent to watch and look, I, I hope it does get sustained. Uh, Maria, we've got about five minutes left. Uh, let me turn to you. It's always struck me that the ED was in some ways 
ground zero for a lot of this. It was uh, obviously you saw the patients first. You had to improvise probably as much as anybody. You know, certainly had to do in the inpatient side and in, in, in the ICU and respiratory care. But and, and then the ED also is the place where kind of the social aspects and the challenges in society meets the healthcare system first and maybe with uh, with the most most vigor. So what were the lessons you took away from it? How do you think the ED responded or our EDs responded to this? And uh, are there any lessons that we need to learn going forward? Yeah, um, definitely. I, th I can think of a couple things. Um, you know, I think one of the things we learned is that, you know, kind of pivoting on, on what Josh said, we can be really, really nimble when we need to be. So for example, the tents that went up, which everyone I'm sure remembers, they're now finally down <laughs> with the new hospital construction, but those went up extremely quickly and we put protocols in place extremely quickly. I mean, that happened within, I wanna say a weekend with just a ton of people up there putting those up. So I think as a group, because we're such team-based care, we have <clears throat> so many different people at any given time involved in the care of a patient. So it really takes buy-in from every single person to get something like that done and to implement new processes. So. Um, I was really proud of us for doing a lot of those different things. I mean, a couple other examples, we were one of the only places I think in the hospital to do point of care testing. And we point of care tested every single patient coming into our emergency department at one point. And that was because we were really focused on, you know, trying to keep our other patients and our providers and staff safe. Um, because as you mentioned, we were ground zero. We don't always know when someone's coming in, they're undifferentiated. So part of our job is to determine, do they have COVID? And the reality is that especially once the numbers of ED visits kind of came back up after that initial severe dip, we had patients as we always do in the hallways. And so we wanted to make sure that we could do the best we could to keep people safe. So that was a big deal, point of care testing everybody. It took a lot of labor. Um, it took, again, new processes implemented right away. Um, and, and we did monoclonal antibodies for folks. At one point, I think we were giving the most monoclonal antibody doses of, of anybody in the health system. So I think one of the really important things about the emergency department is that we really can be a place for interventions for, for people in the moment. And I think COVID is a great example of this. Again, giving people the vaccine, giving people monoclonal antibodies, all that sort of thing. But I think um, when you speak about other issues, social issues that of course we saw exacerbated during COVID and continue to see now in terms of you know serious mental illness, a lot of very, very serious substance use disorder visits, um, you know, we can do interventions in the emergency department to try to confront those things. And, you know, I think that's been something that we've proven and something that we want to continue to do. So, you know, interventions with substance use navigators, giving, you know, treatment for people with opioid use disorder and alcohol use disorder, initiating those things in the emergency department, those kinds of things. I think we've shown that as a team, we, we can do that. Great. Yeah, I, I wonder if we can get the tents up over two days, why it takes seven years for the new hospital, but I guess there's probably some it's, subtle differences I don't understand. <laughs> Maybe last, quite, last question for you is, uh, um, you know, in some ways speaking for the entire clinical staff, doctors, nurses, pharmacists, and others, um, burnout rates are very high. I assume burnout rates are high in the emergency department. How, how do you feel the folks are dealing with it? And do you see any any signs of any hopeful signs on the horizon as we sort of pull out to this next stage? Yeah, I think it's very true. I think it's been for everybody a rough, you know, almost three years, uh, more than three years actually. Um, there has been a lot of, um, I think, I mean, burnout might be a strong word, but I think it's probably appropriate. I mean, I think that's been it's been a slog, and it's been a slog for the people that are coming in having to adapt as um, as people have been saying on the panel to constantly new information, constantly new policies. You're afraid, then you learn you don't have to be as afraid, um, that sort of thing. So I think um, people have weathered it, all things considered, extremely well. I mean, I'm proud to say that in terms of our faculty, we didn't have one person leave, for example, during COVID. And, um, you know, when I put out a job, people still want to come and work here. And so to me, that's one of the best representations of people in our department. And I think throughout this institution, 
and in the emergency department, again, not to speak for other professions, um, they take a lot of pride in their work and the work that we do in the ED. And so even though conditions can be difficult, I think people find the work with patients really meaningful. And I think that's honestly what sustains people through these difficult times. That is a perfect way to end, and I think captures all of our feelings. And I have to say, you know, I've been here forever. I've really never been as proud of the organization, and 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 to some extent, the city. The city responded really well, and UCSF was a pillar of that uh, in terms of what we did and the care we delivered and the research and education and public communication. So, uh, thank you all for sharing your uh, observations with us, and.